Thank you everyone for joining us for the Spirit of the Time Zoomcast. We are here on our 38th flight and we are going to be flying with Disney legend Don Hahn right at the top of the hour. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you guys so much for joining us today on this fabulous Friday. We are going to get started with Don Hahn right at the top of the hour. Welcome to Zeitgeist Design and Production. I'm Becky Kiefer, Studio Director. Here inside the Zeitgeist Creative Studio in Pasadena, California, imagination rules and time is always of the essence. This is where immersion artists Ryan Harmon, Jolan Cicero, and the world's top experienced creators study the past and spin the present envisioning the future of location-based entertainment, or what we like to call UXIRL, User Experiences in Real Life. The Spirit of the Time Zoomcast offers a sneak peek behind the themes. Each month, we move you without a ride system, inviting one incredibly talented and influential colleague aboard our time machine. We set the controls for milestone moments in that person's career and attempt to unravel the mystery of what makes a guest experience timely yet timeless. And because we're live, you can type questions into the chat box and our passenger will answer them after the hour long journey. Climbing aboard our time machine today is producer, writer, artist, 18 time Oscar nominee, and legitimate Disney legend, Don Hahn. A true Renaissance man by any definition, Don produced just a few classic Disney films you may know, including Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, Frankenweenie, and, and Maleficent. Disney nature films like Earth, Oceans, and Chimpanzee and personal documentaries, including Waking Sleeping Beauty and Howard. Don is also the author of a number of amazing books on animation and Disney history, including Yesterday's Tomorrows, Disney's Magical Mid-Century, and The Alchemy of Animation. 
It's now my pleasure to introduce our Time Machine pilots, Zeitgeist President and Chief Creative Officer, Ryan Harmon, and Zeitgeist Executive Vice President and Chief Art Director, Joe Lamb Cicero, along with the man who you'd never know moonlights as a professional drummer, Don Hahn. We are back. Here we are. We just <laughs> came from San Francisco in 2009. 2009. We saw you there, Don. Yeah, this was the preview for the opening of the Disney Family Museum. That fabulous. So cool. It is so good. So amazing. And of course, our our guest today, Don. Oh, let me take off these stupid glasses. <laughs> My Don, broke on that trip wow. back. It was a tough reaction. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to say it is a testament to Don's generosity. One of the most generous men oh, I know, big thinker, that he's on our humble little show I today. Know, you thanks. should be on CBS This Morning or <laughs> NPR or show. something, the Today Show. And right. You're on, on our, our, our humble little Zoom cast. Yes. But um, so happy to have you on today, Don. Don was a part of my early animation life. I got to work with Don, saw his his brilliance firsthand. We actually played in the Disney, uh, what was it called? The Instant Studio Band together, <laughs> serenading wow. people at Christmas time. I interviewed I Don when I was skinny and long hair in the late 80s, I think, for The Lion King uh, cover story that I did for Disney News Magazine. Wow. Okay. So we both have a Don connection. Enough about us. Enough about let's, us. Let's, let's, this bring, man, we, we got five hours of material. Here. I know. Let's, this guy could talk okay. forever. We're going to bypass Chicago. We're going to set the controls for about 1963. And it looks like we're in Bellflower, California in a garage. And you are building what looks like a scale model of the uh, Calico mine train from not to Berry Farm. <laughs> Tell us what's going on here. <laughs> and why is that even important? <laughs> oh. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was muted, which is actually a blessing always with me. Um, <laughs> I was, as a child, I spent a lot of time in my parents' garage, as many of you have. And um, I was just nuts about Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm and stuff. And I would make entire attractions that nobody would see except my sister and uh, which explains a lot about our relationship but i i had made the entire calico mine ride in our garage and um it, complete with uh, a lot of locomotive which was kind of a retrofitted tricycle uh that was pulling a, a a train behind it and i would just ride it around in circles and and yell things like pan for gold um so my sister really loved that for about three minutes and then um you know i would tear it down and build something else but man i love that and i was and still I'm kind of wired as an introvert. So that time, like trying to build and recreate what I saw at Knott's or at Disneyland or something was just a treat. But what did you make it out of the, the rock work? And what did you do to create that? Uh, we we had a new uh, dishwasher. Uh, and so I had a dishwasher box. <laughs> and uh, there was a dumpster behind our okay. house. Uh, and, and I would dumpster dive and find all kinds <laughs> of kind of dangerous things. So um which is also on my bio, the dumpster diving, but um, <laughs> it, it was just whatever I could find. And of course, the yeah. garage is an amazing place for a kid full yeah. of uh, props. And, you know, my, we had an old radio out there from the 20s and oh, uh, cool. sets of golf clubs and, you know, just different things you could use to build out of. And that was that was heaven for me. Yeah. And, you well, built I, Sorry, I, I, and so, Don, talk, talk a little about This sounds like, you know, it was a very formative time, of course, for all of us. Yeah. You know, our, but it sounds like you lived in a very creative household. Talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, your your brother and your parents. Yeah, I did. I have a brother and a sister uh, who are lovely. And and um, my dad was a Lutheran pastor. We were he was at a church in um, uh, in Bellflower, you know, San Gabriel Valley. And and Bellflower at the time had fifty churches, and I'm not making that up. Wow. Uh, and and a lot of cows. It was post World War. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was full of and again, no joke, full of dairy farmers. Um, and you could go out in the front porch at nighttime and just smell cattle, which was Lovely. not really pleasant. Um, and 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 that environment, for some reason, was great. Also, growing up in a kind of church environment, we lived right next door to the church. There was something going on every night. Um, it was a, a lot of shows people were putting on. They were playing games. They were putting on Christmas pageants. Every Sunday, there were stories being told. My mom was the organist in the church, so there was music everywhere. And I don't, I don't know that we thought of it as a particularly creative house, but I, in retrospect, I guess it really was. And that access to storytelling and 
uh, and and people and and you know putting plays on and things like that was just in the house. I just figured everybody was that way. Plus, growing up so close to places like Knott's Berry Farm and and uh, you know Marineland and Disneyland and the Japanese Deer Park and the Hollywood Wax Museum. I mean, all those things. Again, I assumed the world was like that, but it wasn't. So Southern California was really special during that time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, and your brother was an artist at a young age? Well, yeah, I mean, he drew all the time and he was always an inspiration to me because, uh, you know, he would draw little things on the bottom of his notebook and he's he's an industrial engineer. And, um, you know, so it was kind of a, you know, planner, logical thinker kind of guy and, and very athletic. He was a surfer, played little league baseball, um, and so quite different for me in a lot of ways, because I, I tried surfing once, but, uh, it was, man, it, it's, it's really wet and there's <laughs> cold, uh, and baseball Salty. the same way it was wet and cold. And, yeah. um, I just, you know, it, it didn't stick. So, um, I just always went back to building stuff in the garage. Yeah. Wow. So in 1972, you're moving to North Hollywood, you go to North Hollywood high school, and you're a drum major in the band and you're pursuing a music career? Yeah, I was I was always a musician from a young, young age. And, um, you know, it was always a guaranteed Christmas gift to get a drum or some drumsticks or whatever. Yeah. Um, my, my sister played piano. And, and so it was, we had a family band. And, and um, you know, we would go to like retirement homes and play polkas. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, which I, I, you know, looking back, it was really cool. I should still yeah. do that. Um, yeah. but yeah, I, I, um, I'm six foot five. So I was always an easy choice for, as a drum major and, yeah. um, it, you know, and it was, it was good again for my, um, I was a really shy kid and it was just a great way to kind of get out of my skin and, and do something a little bit different. So yeah, I went to North Hollywood high school and, uh, and, you know, later Valley college and Cal state Northridge out in the Valley, but I was a music major the whole time yeah. I played cello um wow. in the orchestra and percussion and i think had i not got a summer job at disney i would still be a musician either teaching or uh, you know playing percussion in the back of an orchestra right oh. so so let's so, talk just for a second about the the impact of of music and playing music you, you talked you didn't do sports but you know, and neither did i and i think we have it in common that no, no, bless yeah. You. yeah most of us <laughs> creative types but um, the importance of, you know, teamwork, you know, when you get, I mean, big part of everything you've done, Don, is about organizing people and understanding how people work together. And mm. I think, you know, probably the lessons of playing music in an orchestra where yeah. you have to think about everybody's part and how, you know, the whole is greater than some of the parts, you yeah. know, and that, that I, you know, I, th I, in fact, I actually use that as an analogy in some talks I, I do about, you know, the create you know, working with creative groups. So do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a big deal. I mean, I think I, I think you're right. I don't know if I ever thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right that it's a such a collaborative and everybody checks their ego at the door and you unpack your musical instrument and you you follow the lead of the conductor or the composer. And, and that's a great feeling because um, when everybody's firing off together, it just, it, and works, that yeah. feeling of collaboration is really special. And uh, I'm sure I brought that, and most people get that, many people get that from sports, but I, I feel music really was that yeah. way. And I really appreciated jazz musicians too, because it wasn't even about following a chart. You would follow a paradigm, uh, you know, you would play blues in a certain key, and that was the only guideline. You know, you, you knew, much like making a movie, you're telling a story about something in yeah. a certain key, and then everybody needs to improvise at their best to make that work. And I think that really applies to kind of why I love that kind of collaborative thing, uh, yeah. making movies even today. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about listening. You have to listen to everybody, you know, yeah. and, um, and be respectful of everybody and trust, you know, I think a great music situation, great, you know, collaborative art situation is about trust, you yeah. know, really so understanding true. what everyone does and bringing that trust to, to it. So, yeah, it's so true. It's so true. I had a, a producer, mentor, colleague, Robert Watts, who did the Indiana Jones movies. And um, he always said, you know, the only reason why we're here is to help the director tell a story and, um, and, and, and hire the best people you can and then get out of their way and do exactly what they tell you to do. And I've always felt like, yep, that's my job. And uh, I always felt like being a producer uh, uh, or, you know, a, a filmmaker that's a leader is really about that. It's surrounding yourself with great people 
and uh, and yes, leading, but also serving those people and getting mm -hmm. them the tools and the information they need. Um, and that, that was a good role for me. I, I fit into that role well. So because we talk mostly to theme better teammate people, which we'll get to, you are to some degree. Tell us about this time where you went to Disneyland to get a summer job. You expected, you know, a nice position in um, design and art and what happened? Well, I, you know, I always loved Disneyland, obviously, and we would go whenever we could. It was expensive. Um, it was, I think, $6.50 to get in then and parking, wow. was, <laughs> parking was 50 cents. I mean, it wasn't oh. free. So um, <laughs> it wasn't every day. Uh, I always loved Disney. I never necessarily wanted to work in the film industry per se. I wanted to work for Disney. And yeah. that's a, a nuance maybe, but it, it's not. It's really what I wanted. Um, I used to park on Keystone Avenue behind the studio in Burbank and climb on the hood of my car when I was 16 years old, look over the fence and go, wow. You know, <laughs> so, um, but I I, um, I did get a summer job at Disney. Uh, one of the guys in our church, Leroy Anderson, ran the morgue. Uh, which is not where Walt Disney is interred. It's actually the uh, a, a, a term from the newspaper industry of where all the scrap is stored and the kind right. of the files and all the old animation was stored there. And man, was that a great job for me. I was 20 years old. And, um, wow. and, and the cool thing, it was underground in the Ink and Paint building and all the artwork was there. And then somebody would call up like Frank Thomas or Milt Call or Wooly Reitherman and just say, hey, I, I need a scene from 101 Dalmatians. I could go to the shelf and pull that off and take it upstairs. And these men and women were so generous. They would they would always want to know what I was interested in. They would always be curious about who I was. And I was nobody. And, and I feel like that um, generosity of spirit was something that really attracted me to Disney too, is it, it was, you know, first name basis and very um, collegial and uh, a culture of learning and a culture of bringing people up from a farm team, almost from internally. Um, and so I, I was a beneficiary of that. I had no aspirations to be a producer, um, but, you know, over the years, that's what matured. And it's because everybody was so generous with me and everybody else that was there. Yeah. Yeah, just for, our, for our viewers who are not familiar with an, the animation world, um, and especially this time that Don is talking about, these these men that Don was mentioning, Frank and Ollie, yeah. Mill Call, these were the guys that created the art form. They they were not, in fact, Don, you wrote a book called The Nine, Nine Old, Old Men. Men. Yeah. And these were the guys that worked, and that that was actually coined by, by Walt Disney. He called them his Nine, right. Nine Old Men. But um, talk about legends, all of them, you know, and what they did was create this this art form yeah. that probably every animated film, probably live action films today, you know, they owe a debt to, to them. So to be around at that time, and I, I caught kind of the tail end of it, Don, you you were there like in the thing when they were all still there. Wow. I mean, wow, talk about a an incredible, you know, creative body of people and to be able to tap into that, that was must have been amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I I was a music major in in college, but I really considered my university to be Disney at that time, yeah. and still is, by the way. You know, if I uh, people like Joe Grant, who wrote Lady and the Tramp and Dumbo, were good friends, and and he was learning when he was ninety years old. You know, he he would go see every movie every every weekend and read the New Yorker cover to cover, and so there's this spirit of um, call it humility or education or uh, culture. Um, that was within the walls of the studio that really rubbed off on me. And um, and I still carry it with me now. And I'm so grateful for that. Yeah, wow, wow. Um, so talk about how you went from your role assisting in the morgue to actually working on films uh, with Don Black. Oh, man, how much time do you have? Uh, we, we, uh, <laughs> I, my... I I um I would get called up once in a while to work in different places where people were needed up to the um the script library where all the old scripts were stored, which was great. A guy named Pete Renaday worked there who did the voice of Henry the Bear in the Country of Air Jamboree. And so oh. Pete would would hang out and we'd tell stories about, you know, uh, television at Disney. Um, but I got called up once to work um, in the art props department. Um which was great, worked with uh, Ted Thomas, Frank Thomas's son. And then eventually uh, they called me up to work with Willie Reitherman's office. His assistant, Lorraine, needed some help. Cool. And just, you know, get some coffee for Willie or uh, take some notes in a meeting. So here's, you know, little little Donnie Hahn from Bellflower, California at, you know, 20 or 21 years old, sitting in the room with Willie Reitherman, 
one of the night old men, Frank Thomas, Ollie Johnston, Don Griffith, the head of layout, all these people taking notes or playing playing takes on a record player. And um, I think at the time, I didn't really realize how important it was or how fantastic it was. I just want to do a good job, show up on time, um, that kind of thing. But just being there, threading the moviola and being in the same room uh, was everything. Like, it, talk about the room where it happens. I mean, that's, I think we were making um, Fox and the Hound at the time. Wow. And so, you know, you go to the recording studio and and we'd be recording Mickey Rooney or something. And um, to be able to hear Wooly direct. And there's a, there's a great new book that Pete Doctor is just finishing about directing an animation. And and uh, to hear these guys work and to hear their their manner, you know, they would an actor would come to the studio and they would start out um, having lunch and they would go have a long lunch in the in the commissary. And then they would say, OK, well, let's go to the stage and we go to the stage. They would pitch some storyboards and it was a leisurely immersive process of directing that would get the best performances out of these actors who were just there for the day and trying to give you know everything they have so the the how to coax a performance out of somebody was uh, you know was really interesting everybody played music uh literally i mean i used to sit in on the um the jazz band at lunchtime and and uh you know which is kind of the remnants of the firehouse five plus two which was the old studio jazz band that ward kimball started um so that that was around um you know in some ways it was a sleepy studio it still had rotary dial telephones and xerox machines were pretty rare um mm -hmm. had really nice linoleum floors and you know sometimes uh long lunches you know every day were normal um but the knowledge was there and the generosity was there and i think eventually that turned into uh you know kind of an explosion of new animation as it got into the 80s and 90s um, yeah. so it, it, I was just lucky to be there and, and starting with Wooly was great. Later, Don Bluth needed an assistant. I worked with Don for a long time on Pete's Dragon. Um, and, and those kinds of senior, uh, directors were really influential. I was just super lucky to be in the room with them. So then you worked on, I'm just looking at the list. You did the small one, which was wonderful. Yep. And Fox and the Hound, we talked about Mickey's Christmas Carol, Black Cauldron. Let's mm -hmm. talk about Black Cauldron. That was kind of a, a turning point, I think. Yeah, I mean, you, you made the film uh, Waking Sleeping Beauty about this era. And, you know, after Walt passed away and this era, how animation changed and the guard changed and things kind were of not lost its way and then found its way. Its way. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's, um, it's, it was a tough time. And uh, years of therapy and medication <laughs> have blurred it a bit. But um, the... Um, the time was mixed because you had people at the end of their careers and people at the beginning of their careers. Yeah, right. So coming in the door was, uh, you know, people like you, Joe, um, um, Glenn Keane, Mark Hen, Tim Burton, uh, John Lasseter, John Musker, Ron Clements, Ron Husband, all these people coming in from Cal Arts and different places. Um, and then people exiting their careers uh, on the other end. So it created... Uh, a dynamic in the studio that was difficult sometimes. Um, Black Cauldron is kind of the poster boy for that. It It is full of great work, if you ever want to see it. Um, it is not a great story and not a great movie as a whole. Um, but, you know, it was a transitional movie. That's all I can say. Yeah. A transitional yeah. movie where it was worked on partially by um, youngins and partially by veterans who were trying to show that they could do it too. There was also a time when nobody would go see a Disney movie. You wouldn't be caught dead, especially on a date hmm. night. Was not cool. Yeah. At a Disney movie, you know, in contrast to years later when you would take your date to Aladdin or something like that. Yeah. So it just was not cool to go to a Disney movie at all. The company was being financed pretty much just by the parks. So yeah. Disneyland, Walt Disney World, huge hits. Uh, Tokyo Disneyland, Ron Miller, who ran the company during those days with Card Walker, um, really did some amazing things, including starting the Touchstone brand, um, and and some great movies like Splash came out of that. Um, but yeah, Black Cauldron was purely a transitional film, so much so that it was still in, still in production when uh, Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg and Frank Wells came into the company, which was a management change that happened uh, in 1984, which was oh yeah. my god, so long ago. Yeah. Um, but it was it was a dynamic change where the, kind of the whole world spun around at Disney and a new era began. Wow. wow. So, so, oh, so. Oh, I don't know why it's no. a photo now. But um, <laughs> so then we went to Great Mouse Detective, 
um, and he worked with John Musker and Ron Clemens, um, who did, were they the ones who you said did um, the Wonders of Life Pavilion? The, uh, oh no no that the, that was that was oh, Gary and, and oh Gary okay sorry yeah. I got we're, we're we're getting ahead of ourselves okay, okay. but but again I think this is a very seminal time yeah. so Black Cauldron then I remember there was even talk at one point you know the rumor going around that they wanted to shut down animation that right you know I think when Frank Frank and and uh, Michael came in you know they were looking around the company and trying to figure out you know what they had and what was going on and I, I just remember those rumors and you know sitting in your office wondering hmm, is this going to continue or not <laughs> yeah yeah you, you, you were there great detective, yeah, right? yeah. Wow. yeah you know i think uh a couple things saved it i don't i don't know that there was ever serious talk in fact i asked michael Lewis once there's never serious talk about shutting down animation and one of the big reasons was roy disney so roy edward disney roy. who um is roy o disney's son was very present and very much part of bringing in yeah. frank wells and Michael Eisner and Roy loved animation and Roy pretty much said, you guys go fix the studio, give me animation. And, and that was a blessing for us because Roy was our defender and he was also the interpreter to interpret what animation was to the executives. And, um, and, and so animation was, we'd make a movie every four years. Uh, there was no real deadline on and no real limits on budget in those early years. And the one big thing that changed it along with the new management was um, home video. All of a sudden, you could put uh, Pinocchio out in a home video, and it would be free cash, a cash cow for the company for a movie that has was on the shelf, basically. And I think that woke up a lot of people. Uh, it was a slow transition because at first, people, including Roy, said, you can't do this. If you put movies out on home video, you'll never be able to re-release them in theaters again. It was a very slow, difficult transition um, to convince everybody that home video was a good thing which is so unbelievable now that you think of streaming where you oh, can, yeah. you know, sit down tonight and watch any one of a million movies that was ever made, yeah. but it wasn't that way. So that was a cash cow that brought in a lot of movies and it mean it meant we had to replenish the library. The other good thing that happened was CalArts. And a lot of people say like, what was the, what was the key con contribution of Walt Disney? And along with a bazillion other things, CalArts has got to be at the top of the list because, you know, a guy who didn't really make it beyond the eighth grade had this passion for education and arts education. And um, and we were the beneficiaries of that because a, a large majority of people came through that CalArts program and matured as talents just as home video was coming along, just as new management was coming in. And with enough time in the oven, we're starting to turn out films like Great Mouse Detective and eventually Roger Rabbit and Little Mermaid. And that kind of started it all. So it was a perfect storm of all these elements um, coming together that started to create that kind of boom of the 90s. So you you just mentioned very, again, very important film for in the history of film in general, not just animation. That was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yep. And you had a very, very important role in there. Why don't you talk to us? Yeah, and you lived in London. I did, yeah. I, I had worked with Don Bluth and with the gang on... Um, Pete's Dragon. So I had a passing knowledge of live action and animation combination. Um, and, and so um, I, they asked me to go over to Amblin and um, start meeting on Roger Rabbit. So again, it was kind of an uh, imposter syndrome moment where I'm sitting in uh, Amblin, Steven Spielberg's company uh, with Steven Spielberg and Richard Williams, the animation director, uh, and Bob Zemeckis, who had just done Back to the Future. And uh, once again, a little Donny Hahn from Bellflower, California. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I was able to contribute. And uh, and the good thing is uh, Bob Zemeckis, who I think is a genius, um, broke a lot of the rules. We used to have very strict rules about animation, live action combination. You had to lock the camera down. Uh, you really couldn't do too much. And he said, no, we really want to move the camera. We want to have the tunes interact with the environment. If Roger uh, puts his hand on a chair and takes it off, you want to see his fingerprints on the chair. And that kind of uh, was very liberating. I also brought in some story people from animation, um, Joe Ranft, the brilliant Joe Ranft, which is worth an, a whole episode of his own, um, came in and storyboarded for us on that movie. Um, Hans Bacher, the art director, uh, and others. Um, and then, yes, I we shot in London. Um, so I moved to London for two years and produced the animation uh, with Richard Williams. And it was great. And I think part of it, 
this sounds really weird, but I'll, uh, and too much information, but Richard Williams, everybody said, I can't work with Richard Williams. They're terrible. Richard Williams had never really completed a lot of movies. And he, um, he played Dixieland jazz. He loved Bix Beiderbecke. And every Sunday at the Grosvenor House in London, he would play and I would go play with him. And I think one of the reasons we had a relationship wow. was that I played Dixieland with him. Yeah. And and that was, wasn't the only reason. And and I did everything I could to support him. But talk about genius. I mean, Richard Williams, those of you in the animation community know, yeah. was was a brilliant, brilliant guy. So I lived and worked in London. I brought over people like Andreas Deja, Phil Niblink, and hired a lot of people. I hired James Baxter, who's this amazing legendary animator now. Um, we just hired him out of art school because we were starting up a studio from scratch. And um, it, it was the most difficult thing I think I've ever done because you're acclimating to a new environment, putting a studio together, trying to do a live action movie while you're doing uh, animation, but incredibly supported by Zemeckis and Williams and a great experience. Wow. So, oh, just a question. What, what did um, Richard Williams play? What instrument? Trumpet. Oh. Yeah, cornet. Wow. Yeah. Great player, too. I mean, he wasn't just a hack. Uh, he, he really studied and, you know, if you want a good Christmas present, you could always get him the latest CD of Bix Beiderbeck or uh, <laughs> Louis Armstrong. So wow. great guy. I mean, I, I just um, eccentric as they come. Um, he would put off, we did a test on Roger Rabbit that he wanted to animate by himself. And he animated the whole maroon cartoon at the beginning of the movie by himself. Oh, wow. Um, and, and of course, did it at midnight the night before it was due. So um <laughs> you know brilliant eccentric a crazy brilliant genius yeah wow. so at this time around 1986 1987 it looks like you're also picking up another hobby painting tell us about that yeah i mean living in london was a new experience um i also got married because i wanted to add as much stress to my life at the time that i could <laughs> and um, i think you're doing a good job <laughs> yeah i still am and uh, mm -hmm. married this this like terrific woman who I'm still married to, um, Denise, who's an artist and um, a painter and uh, worked in animation also. And uh, but every weekend we'd go to a museum. So the thing about London is you're surrounded by the most brilliant art and collections anywhere. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I'm going to try painting because I always drew and and um, and so I bought an oil kit and started painting on the weekends and going out and just copying paintings. You know, I I was a total amateur and totally self-taught and um and now you know 40 years later i still am painting and it's my release i don't uh, i don't play poker i don't golf um I, you know I, i'd love to paint uh, once again because it's a solitary sport i can go out in nature and and struggle with light and shapes and um that activity is so good and and uh, cleansing kind of for me wow. and that started in london it was some, you know, pretty bad paintings. And um, I still do pretty bad paintings once in a while, but every once in a while I get to it and, um, and, and love it. And and boy, can't recommend it enough for those of you out there that paint a little bit. Yeah. So 1989, we're here. Uh, you worked on Tummy Trouble. And then shortly thereafter, you started on what would become the first animated film ever, ever. to be nominated for a Best Picture Oscar, tell us about the making of Beauty and the Beast. Wow. Well, you know, it's funny. We first offered Beauty and the Beast to Bob Zemeckis because we were done, which I don't think I've ever told anybody before. What? We were done with Roger Rabbit. Um, he he was going to go on and make Back to the Future sequels, though, which he did. And um, then we offered it to Richard Williams. He was going to go off and make The Thief and the Cobbler, which was his kind of lifetime movie. Um, and then Richard said, you know, one of my protégés, Richard Purdom, um, would be great for this. And so we approached Richard Purdom, Canadian animator who was living in London and had his own commercial studio. And we actually set up shop in London and worked with Richard Purdom on it. I brought over Glenn Keane, Tom Cito, Tom Enriquez, Gene Gilmore. We had a great, great cast in London. We did 20 minutes of the film in London um, and took it over to uh, Walt Disney World actually to show during the opening weekend of Little Mermaid and show it to Jeffrey and Roy and Michael and the lights came up afterwards and Jeffrey said, well, I think it's time to fish or cut bait. And uh, meaning this is awful. We can't go on with this. And the oh, truth wow. is it wasn't awful. I mean, it's around, you can see it. It was just very European, very masterpiece theater, very uh, Jean Cocteau. And 
So not awful at all, just very different from uh, Little Mermaid that had just come out to huge reviews. Um, so we continued working, and and by that time also Aladdin was in huge story problems, which meant Ashman and Mencken were available. And so we cornered Howard at a beach party in Malibu at Jeffrey's house and said, Howard, you're not doing anything on Aladdin. Would you be willing to come over and do uh, Beauty and the Beast? Uh, and And he said yes, which was a miracle of all miracles. Uh, so pr the key to producing animation is not only getting the best people you can, but having great luck. Um, getting Howard Ashman and Alan Menken on that show just off of Little Mermaid was unbelievable. Eventually, we replaced directors with two young directors who had never directed before, one of which was in his 20s, Kirk Wise and Gary Trousdale, uh, both out of CalArts, both brilliant storytellers. And, and I've worked on Atlantis and Hunchback of Notre Dame with them. And they're like brothers to me. They're just so gifted. But this was their first movie. The only thing they had done was the pre-show to the, um, was it the the um, Cranium Command? Cranium Command, that's what I was talking about. Life and oh, Health oh, Pavilion, oh, which I'm not sure is there anymore at Epcot. No, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So that pre-show was Kirk and Gary's only audition tape. And uh, suddenly they were directing Beauty and the Beast. And, wow. and it worked. <laughs> wow, boy, it did it, it, did it ever. <laughs> so it was good. a battlefield promotion, you know. Yeah. What was the thinking within animation at the time? Because they'd gone away from the classic European fairy tales until they came back to Little Mermaid. Was that kind of the new rule? We're going to go back to what Walt was successful with and start doing these European you know, yeah, I mean, again, the the kind of quiet driver in the business side was home video. So you had to replenish with one movie a year. Oh, um, okay. And so it was a very busy time. But a lot of those ideas came internally. You know, um, um, Mike Gabriel, for example, we did a gong show every once in a while uh, based on the old Chuck Barris gong show on TV for oh, right. people who are elderly in the audience. <laughs> um, and you could come in and pitch any idea. And, and uh, you know, Mike Gabriel, one of our directors, came in and held up a poster and said, it's uh, Romeo and Juliet meets Dances with Wolves, Pocahontas. And and the executives would go, yep, we're making that. Next. And, and so it was really a way for the uh, kind of grassroots uh, pitches to come to the surface. And um, a lot of those Treasure Planet, uh, uh, Ron and John had been working on Little Mermaid for a while. Um uh, Aladdin was something uh, that Howard Ashman brought in. So it was a wonderful bottom-up kind of structure. Uh, there was no executive saying, uh, you know, my kids really like Beauty and the Beast. Let's do Beauty and the Beast. It wasn't that at all. It was really a chance for everybody to weigh in, which created a really terrific ownership of the properties. Uh, and of course, we were going to great properties that had never been done before. I mean, some some wouldn't quite work, like a Rumpelstiltskin or something. You just think, eh, hey, that's kind of a short subject. But Beauty and the Beast, Walt considered. There's notes in the morgue about Walt and Frank and Ollie oh, wow. and talking about it, wow. uh, it, which should have given us a clue because uh, he abandoned it. We should have stopped for a moment and thought, why did he abandon it? Um, right. But we were young and foolish and and dove in. And we had Ashman and Mencken and we had Kirk Wise and Gary Trousdale. And we had a story team that is exceptional because my story team was Roger Allers, who went on to direct Lion King, Brenda Chapman, who went on to direct Brave, uh, Chris Sanders, who went on to direct Lilo and Stitch and How to Train Your Dragon and and like an amazing movie that's coming out now. Um, so yeah, we had a brilliant kind of, uh, again, young, hungry, interesting group of uh, story people coming up to create that movie. And that's wow. what worked. Wow. wow. So moving, <laughs> moving now to the next biggie. Yeah, probably, just when you no think big, it couldn't get any bigger. bigger. <laughs> and, and and just now you were just talking about the the genesis you know where these films came from yeah so not not a classic fairy no, tale original not, story. yeah the lion King. yeah what where did that come from well there's there's different origin stories because uh, success has a thousand uh uncles but um there's a guy named charlie fink who ran our development department um and charlie started developing it uh king of the kalahari was the name of it um, but most of us knew it as Bambi in Africa. And and uh, it's something that uh, Jeffrey and Roy and Peter Schneider jumped on. Um, so Bambi in Africa was in uh, development. A number of writers kind of came and went through it. Um, and, and it developed slowly. Um, 
it was after Beauty and the Beast, it was, I, I got on as a producer and it was really hard to get people to work on because I would, I would sit down with an animator at lunch and I'd say, we really want you to do this movie. And they would ask what the story was. And I would say, well, it's a, it's about a lion cub. It's kind of Hamlet in Africa, about a lion cub who gets framed for murder with music by that great African composer, Elton John. And, <laughs> and, and people would just run, you know, they would just run to Pocahontas or wherever they could go. Yeah. And rightly so. Um, but the people we got on that movie were either first timers, people who wanted an opportunity to lead a character, um, people like Tony Bancroft, uh, or people like Andrea Stasia, who grew up loving Jungle Book, and the chance to animate quadrupeds and do that was a big call for him. Um, we went through a director change on that movie, and Roger Ellers and Rob Minkoff came in. And again, our head of story was Brenda Chapman, um, Irene Mecki, our writer. We had a great team. And that movie was written in two days in my office uh, in Glendale wow. at a wow. building right next to Imagineering. Yeah, um, yeah, that's where I met you. Yeah, so. we were on Airway, and it was uh, that group, Kirk, Kirk Wise and Gary Trailsdale from Beauty and the Beast joined us, Brenda, Rob, and Roger. We had pizza, we had um, alcoholic beverages, and <laughs> we, we locked ourselves in for two days and came out two days later with essentially what is the movie. Wow, uh, wow. So yeah, uh, so Tim Rice did, was in the studio at the time too, and that was another kind of win for that movie. Wow! How did Elton get involved? Well, Tim was in writing songs for Aladdin. Uh, Howard had passed away sadly, and Tim was collaborating with Alan Menken. Yeah, Alan was sure he wouldn't have a career after Howard passed away, but he and Tim hit it off great and wrote songs like "A Whole New World." And um, so Tim got involved and started writing sketches for songs, and he said. You know, the perfect group for this music would be ABBA. And we ABBA. said, well, we're, we're, we're thinking of Ladysmith, Black Bombazo. We're thinking of Paul Simon and Graceland. We're, yeah. And he, and he had just worked with ABBA, uh, you know, doing chess in the West End in London. Um, ABBA couldn't do it. And they would have been fine, I suppose, on some strange level. Um, and then he said, what about Elton John? And it, again, just being honest, was a head scratcher. It was like, has yeah. he ever done a musical before? No he's a brilliant songwriter and tim said i think he can do it and, and we went out to him and met with him and um he said yes and so that was it was it was difficult not for him he is brilliant as a tunesmith every bit as brilliant as Mencken or the shermans or whatever and collaborative you he's not a diva at all in a work environment so for example, the first version of Circle of Life he wrote was kind of a bubblegummy pop song and it didn't work and we asked him to rewrite it he didn't throw a, a fit or anything. He came back and said, yeah, I, I'd rather rewrite it than try to, you know, fix it. And so he would come back with a new version. And that was what made him so great is brilliant tunesmith and, and as collaborative as anybody else in the room, which is animation. It's a team sport. There's no, you know, aside from the directors, there's no, um, you know, divas allowed. So he really delivered. Uh, and the, the kind of third leg of the music thing, along with Tim and Elton was Hans Zimmer. And we had never worked with Hans before. And Hans had just done a movie called The Power of One, mm -hmm. um, which was all about South Africa and Nelson Mandela. And um, and he brought in Lebo M, the South African singer who gave that great cry in the wilderness at the beginning of the show. So yeah. that that kind of package of music, along with a great story team, started to turn uh, King of the Kalahari <laughs> into The Lion King. Wow, what a great story. Well, I'm I mean, exhausted just talking about it. Yeah. Wow. And then the Lion King, it was one of those that we we're, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how so many of the things that you touched became, you know, Disney rides, yeah. Disney shows. I mean, it's now gone on to become what one of the biggest the, Broadway yeah. shows in history. Yeah. Amazing. Everywhere. It's like everywhere I travel in the world, there's a version of <laughs> right. the Lion King playing right. somewhere. Right. Yeah. Well, I, 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 Joe, you know this. I was in Madrid in May this year you get off the train and there's Lion King posters everywhere in, in eight cities around the world tonight. You can go see the wow. Lion King tonight. Wow. <laughs> so were, were you involved at all in any of the development of the, the, the Broadway version, the original Broadway version? No, you know, we had a, a, a really, you oh, know, there pretty, you are. <laughs> hi, hello. That's me in Madrid with a Lion King poster. Oh, yeah. um, I had a great executive named Tom Schumacher and Tom and Peter Schneider, uh, our other executive both came from theater. They were responsible for the Olympic Arts Festival in 1984 in Los Angeles. Yep. And um, Tom and Peter 
when Michael Eisner was the one that said, let's do Lion King on the stage. And we just fell on the floor laughing. We just thought, oh, this is the worst idea ever. It's going to be like a rubber head costume show or something. And um, so, but Michael said, no, I think it can work. And, and to their credit, Peter and Tom brought in uh, this person they had worked with on the Olympic Arts Festival, Julie Tamor. Oh, gosh. Uh, I don't have to say anything else. If you've seen Lion King, it's Julie Tamor. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we had a handoff. We met with her a few times, but you, Julie Tamor doesn't need much help. She's a visual artist, and uh, she created what is now such a huge success and one of the longest running shows um, because of her. You know, we took our story, basically, and, and in a very clever way, Tom and Peter put Roger Allers, the director of Lion King, and Irene Mecki, one of the writers of Lion King, together to write the book for the stage play. So the story carried on with an incredibly different visual palette, and um, I think that's what makes that show work. And uh, if everybody was paying attention over D23, The Lion King was going to be a Splash Mountain-style ride at Disneyland Paris in the next year. Things just live on forever. <laughs> and we should mention Beauty and the Beast is an amazing attraction at Tokyo Disneyland. In Tokyo, unbelievably yeah, yeah. so. Just the yeah. technology and the look of that ride is amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. and at Walt Disney World. Walt Bell. Disney World, the storytelling with Belle, also one of my favorite yeah. effects I've ever seen. Um, so, Don, you went on and did Hunchback of Notre Dame, another great story. And then you found books. You started making, uh, uh, writing books. Uh, tell us how you transitioned from producing movies and playing drums and painting, <laughs> painting and... to uh, did you just have I, some free time. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, wanting to introduce more stress into my life. I um, <laughs> and discovering I probably have some form of uh, attention deficit disorder. I, um, I I had experienced a lot of things in my short career at, at that time, working with some great people, and I didn't. I wanted to write that down. I wanted to memorialize it. And I, I didn't want to write a memoir necessarily, but I want to write something about those experiences. And Wendy Lefcon at Disney Edition said, well, why don't you write about the process and the creative process and tell some of those stories? And that resulted in um, a number of books. I, I did a book on um, creativity called Dancing Corn Dogs in the Night, which is named after the drive-in movies uh, commercials that would oh, play right. or drive-in oh, right. movies. I wondered what that was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, if you're uh, of a certain age, <laughs> yeah. there were snack bar cartoons yeah. before you right. saw the main feature. Um, I wrote another book for for uh, about the animation process because um, a lot of people that were either new executives at Disney or just young people wanting to get into animation. So I wrote a book about that. And um, I don't know, again, it goes back to that uh, solitary expression and time I like to spend alone. Yeah. Um, at the same time that I would you know, be building things in the garage as a kid, right. writing is the same experience. And um, it's just being in that zone where you're alone late at night in your pajamas and you're trying to make something work is a really magical thing for me. And um, so that's where that comes from. And it's also refreshing because during the day you're collaborating, you're, you're talking to a lot of people, you're in meetings, you don't have control over your life. Right. And so writing was a way of recapturing my life at nighttime yeah. uh, and, and, and losing a lot of sleep. Yeah. Did you find it ever help your creative process to wear pajamas to work? <laughs> um, yes, yes, until <laughs> HR gave me a call. So it was, um, <laughs> yeah, but that was a long time ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I love the people I work with. That's the only way I can say it. Animators and people in the animation industry, it's very different than the film industry. And I find the same for Imagineering, uh, and you guys must experience it too. Yeah. Uh, the people are in that industry because they love it. Yeah, it's cyclical. Passion. It has its ups and downs. You're making money, you're losing money, whatever. Yeah. But uh, you're in it because you love it, and I love those people. Well, yeah. well so that, this is a good segue because you just mentioned the difference between animation, Imagineering, and live action. But you made that transition into live action, you know, um, 2003 doing the Haunted Mansion. So... How, how did that happen? And what are your thoughts and feelings about it? Wow. I, I knew I needed a, um, I wanted another chapter in my life. I felt like the world didn't need another animated movie from me anyway. And uh, it was a time for some fresh voices to do animation, thankfully. Um, and, and I think every, everybody in animation, you know, whether you're Tim Burton or Brad Bird or whatever wants to try live action as a producer, it was a different experience. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I was able to work with Rob Minkoff, who I knew really well from Lion King yeah. and uh, and Eddie Murphy at the time and did that original Haunted Mansion movie. But what was thrilling about it, just as a sidebar, was going over to Imagine Imagineering or going to Disneyland at six in the morning and walking the ride system for Haunted Mansion <laughs> the lights no. on. No, I mean, it, that is unbelievable. And, you know, to see it's it's a very oddly... It's humbling, but it's a very uh, humble set in the Haunted Mansion and their effects and the lighting and all that stuff is what makes it. Um, so learning what we could about the backstory and the history and the mythology of Haunted Mansion was really fascinating. Yeah. And then again, a great crew to kind of recreate that. So that was a cool experience. Uh, and, you know, I directed some of the live action in Fantasia 2000 and, and later yeah. worked on Maleficent with Angelina Jolie um, as one of many producers on that show. Uh, but it's it's great. Uh, so here's a controversial thing. I find live action boring. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, hurry up and wait. You're waiting for sets. You're waiting for lighting to happen. Yeah. Um, it, it's animation is oddly exciting. It's busy every day. There's things happening and it's engaging in a way that as a producer or on a, on a live action set, it's really the director's world. And, and rightly so. The director is always the principal storyteller. Yeah. So as much as I enjoyed making those movies, I didn't gravitate to it in a huge way uh, because I guess my heart was in animation and that process and those people. So nothing wrong with live action, but animation was just something that, that uh, always was in my heart. Wow. Yeah. And it's so much so that there was that moment where there were some big changes at the studio. John Lasseter came in, Ed Catmull from Pixar. Pixar had been, been bought uh, by Disney. And uh, they, they're they asking you now to come and head up the studio? Yeah, you're running Disney. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. This this could be um, part of the show where we want to pour some cocktails, actually. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm all, you're always up for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For those of you who would like. Um, yeah, it was 2006. Disney bought Pixar. And, um, oh, man, a, again, a very difficult time, which seems to be the case at Disney. Um, never easy. Uh, Roy Disney was certainly for it. Um, Steve Jobs wanted to sell Pixar. Uh, he needed money to develop um, the iPad and some of his iPhone things. Um, so it worked out. And I knew Ed uh, Catmull really well, and I knew John Lasseter really well. And um, they needed somebody to run animation who didn't have aspirations of becoming an executive, but who knew all the players and who would make it run for a year while the transition happened. And that ended up being me. Um, so, you know, I was, I was, I was happy to do it. Um, I, Ed and John trusted me um, and they're brilliant guys. I mean, I, I know, you know, if you read the headlines, there's been issues with John and whatever, and that's fine. I, we all have issues um, and it doesn't forgive that necessarily, but um, he is a brilliant storyteller. And I think what he gave Disney animation in Los Angeles and Burbank was permission to, um, tell great stories and to be difficult on ourselves and to um, create a brain trust of, of creative people that could challenge each other. And also Ed Catmull brought in a technology. I mean, I'm not sure we even had Wi-Fi in the building in 2006 when he walked in the door. So I literally, uh, literally the three of us walked in the door of feature animation and, and we said, okay, well, here we go. And they revolutionized the place. It took a few years. Um, but then you start to get movies like Wreck-It Ralph and, uh, I mean, so many wonderful movies from an era uh, because of their input and their collaboration. Yeah. And what people may not know is we always exchanged with Pixar. Pixar grows out of feature animation in Burbank. For Toy Story, we always sent up uh, Joe Ramft or Kirk Wise and Gary Trousdale or Roger Allers to give them story notes and work on their story. Um, and, and conversely, people from Pixar would come down and work on our stories. So they were always cousins. Yeah. And over the years, that that separated a little bit more. But um, there was always a strong relationship between the two studios. And then Pixar eventually eclipsed uh, Burbank. Um, and, and now both are hitting home runs and, you know, doing what they can to make great movies. So, yeah, that was a year that was really different. And I never aspired to be an executive. Um, you know, really, I aspire to build attractions in my garage. So I feel like I was happy to do it. Again, love the people, honored to be able to help that transition. Um, and then also honored to step away from that. And um, I took some time off after that. I just thought I needed a new chapter. I, yeah. I started working on Princess and the Frog. Um, Ed Catmull wanted me to run feature animation. 
after that. And I said, you know, it's just not in my heart. And I, um, I, I went into some meetings with um, Ron and John on Princess and the Frog. I love them. They're great. But I, it felt like Groundhog Day. I felt like I've done this before. And for my own health and probably the health of the studio, um, it's time to move on. Well, we don't want to overlook that you also worked on uh, The Emperor's New Groove and Atlantis. Oh, yeah. And Atlantis, again, with Kirk and Gary. Yeah. Um, was a great opportunity to do something, again, trying to do something different. Right. It, it's 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 had a, a huge audience now that it's on Disney Plus and out there. But we just, the pitch for Atlantis was this. We said, we're going to Disneyland. Instead of going through the castle to Fantasyland like we have for the last 10 years, we're going to go to Adventureland and make a movie that's still cut out of the cloth of of Disney, but very different than a fairy tale. And that was the pitch for Atlantis. Wow. You know, um, we're, we're getting short on time, but I want you to talk a little bit about, because um, when we spoke a few days ago, something that stayed with me about, because we, we always talk about story, story, story. You know, it's about both in, in animation, live action film, and, and a lot in the theme park world. You know, you got to have stories. Stories, the foundation. But something you said, and I've actually heard you talk about this, you know, the importance of character yeah. and really at, at the base of it, you know, you know, people love people, people love characters. And that's the thing that really makes, I think, and, and I think it's true of everything you've done, Don, you know, it's always about the strength of those characters, both the good guys, the bad guys, the, the sidekicks, you know, and you fall in love with them, you know, the appeal of the characters. And I, I think that's uh, so important. And a lot of our listeners and who are watching today, you know, are both interested in in film and and in uh, theme park work. Um, but I, I think here's some words of wisdom from Don Hahn on the importance of character. Yeah, perfect. Wow, well, there are actually words of wisdom from Joe Rant, uh, Joe, Joe Grant, who you know wrote Dumbo. We were talking about before, and uh, he said, uh, you know, Don, it's it's really about character. And I said, what do you mean? He said. And Joe ran the character department at Disney when Walt was there. Um, so they developed character long before they developed story. He said, story is plot, and it's a mathematical equation to a certain degree. You have A plus B plus C equals D, and you can figure that out. But if you have interesting characters, you'll watch them do anything, like Seinfeld characters, um, the, um, the Lucy Show, um, The Simpsons. You will watch The Simpsons do anything. South Park. Um, and his point is well taken because if those characters are compelling and interesting and gettable, you relate to them and you get a, a touch of humanity from them. Mm -hmm. And ever since he said that, I just thought, oh, that's the secret. <laughs> you know, yeah. story is story. And there's plenty of movies out there with flawed stories, but great characters yeah. right. that survive and do really well. Um, and conversely, there's plenty of movies out there that have spectacular, pristine mathematical plot and boring characters that nobody cares about. Yeah. Rightly or wrongly, we're narcissistic as a race of people. We love to hear stories about ourselves. We don't care so much about places or buildings or whatever, but boy, you tell a story about a person uh, and, and create a struggle or a conflict in that story, and we're there every time. And that goes back to the you know the writings of Carl Jung, the the um, psychologist talking about character archetypes, the you know the hero, the villain, the Earth Mother, the you know the shapeshifter, uh, or the the hero's journey stories uh, that Joseph Campbell writes about, which is basically a Lion King kind of story or Harry Potter kind of story. I mean, those are all about um, journeys made by really uh, characters that we know and we relate to because there's a little bit of us in those characters. There's a little bit of us in even in the villain or the Earth Mother or the hero or the love interest. We can see ourselves in those characters. And that's what makes us tune in again and again. So, Words of wisdom. Yeah, amazing. So uh, 2007, we're here right now, and you did the chestnut tree with uh, Hyun Lan Lee. Did I say that properly? A little yeah. different for you. Well, what was that? Oh, it's a short done by a, a an animator who at the time was very young and just out of school, and I just loved her work. And since then, she's become one of the leads at Disney for the last 10 years. I was searching a lot as I have my whole life. Yeah. Um, again, Joe Grant at 90 years old said, you know, it's it's about reinvention, Don. He reinvented his life every day. And I thought, oh, well, I guess I better do that. 
Um, so I worked on some shorts. Uh, yeah. I did nature movies for a while, which that's, I loved because that's where I was going. Yeah, nature. Yeah, the, uh, you know these wonderful photographers from BBC Nature would go out in the field and film lions or film chimpanzees and come back to Bristol, England, with thousands of hours of footage. Yeah. And then we would sit there and say, "Okay, is there a story here?" And you would manufacture a story out of what chimpanzees do. And chimpanzees basically they they eat, they sleep, they mate, and they throw poop. So that's your toolbox. <laughs> and and you have to say, okay, how do we create a story out of this? Right, right. And and I loved it. And those filmmakers are insane. I mean, they will go out there. We were shooting the Ivory Coast on the chimpanzee movie, and civil war broke out and they, you know so they had to decamp and then come back six months later and try to find the same chimpanzees that they were filming oh, and then wow. one of them had died and you know so it's, yeah. a, it's a thankless job that they are so good at and i felt really my role was story i would go sit with them and we'd workshop story ideas um so that was that was a bit of really good luck and met some amazing people during those times wow. so then you got to 2009 waking sleeping beauty an amazing film because we lived yeah. that era and it touched on imagineering to some degree too. Um, and, yeah. then, and then you got involved with the Walt Disney Family Museum too and developed the Christmas with Walt story with the family. Uh, which Yeah, that's, that's something that Diane, Walt's daughter, asked for uh, to kind of celebrate Walt's life and how much he loved Christmas. And yeah. it was originally a museum film that only showed in the museum and then Disney Plus was looking for some holiday content last year and we um kind of oh, recut wow. it put it together for for disney plus so it's on the air wow. uh, it will be on the air again this year oh that's great and you did two books that year the drawn to life books tell us about those too well i i was again always searching for uh stuff to do uh drawn to life was the writings mainly of a gentleman named walt stanchfield who was our mentor i mean joe lancicero you knew him oh gosh uh, really well and and walt was our teacher he was our our sensei he was like our coach uh, on a very grassroots level about drawing and and action analysis and that kind of thing. So those books are really his lectures that I edited and pulled together. Yeah. I mean, it, during this time of my life, I was really looking to give back a little. And a lot of the things I did in terms of books were publishing other people's work and, and yeah. collating those so that they wouldn't vanish. Right. Uh, and then in, in my film life, I really got interested in documentaries because the, the world was changing. Um, elections had happened, uh, a number of things were happening where I thought I can use my filmmaking toolbox to tell stories about people that don't have a voice or about social issues I cared in. Uh, and the real real topic of what I wanted to do was uh, tell stories about artistic heroes of mine. There's plenty of, plenty of movies about political heroes or sports heroes. And I thought, you know, there's artistic heroes out here that have had huge influence on culture that need to be memorialized. And so yeah. I made a film about Tyrus Wong and about Howard Ashman and that's the stuff that I love. Um, yeah, this Howard, that was amazing. Well, I think yeah. it all speaks to your your spirit of generosity, Don. I think it's been a, a thread through, I think your whole life. You know, your 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 generous spirit. You know, and and, and giving to people, and allowing them to give too. You know, when you when you create an atmosphere, it seems like you know it, whether you're doing a live action film or an animated film or you know, working with the, the Disney Museum, you know, creating that atmosphere where, again, like we talked about earlier, being with other musicians, it's about trust, it's about openness, you know, and probably goes in, probably goes back to your, your father and, you know, the influence of him and church life and, you know, all the, it's all positive stuff, yeah. you know, and it's, I'm sitting here listening to you and looking at, you know, all these amazing accomplishments. I think it, I, I'm trying to find like, well, what's that core thing? And I think it's that trust, that openness and it's generosity, you know? And I think those are good lessons for everybody who's listening there, you young people, listen to Don. <laughs> yeah, and it, it cuts both ways. I mean, I, I try to be generous because I don't own it. You know, I don't, yeah. everything that I pass along and pretty much everything I've said today was passed along to me by yeah. somebody else. So why would I try to own that necessarily? Yeah. Uh, plus, I if I'm generous, I find that other people will be generous back to me in terms of their life stories or their interests or whatever, and that allows me to grow a little bit too. So, um, yeah, it, it it I think it works, especially for a life in the arts. You can't isolate yourself. You really need those voices um, to feed back to you what's working and what's not working, and be honest with you and 
we all have people in our lives that will tell us that we're great and that our work is untouchable. We really need those treasured friends that'll say, wow, Don, this really sucks. And, and yeah. those are the people that I admire because they're being yeah. generous. Yeah. Yeah. Or critical. <laughs> How are we doing time yeah. wise? Uh, painful, but still. Well, we're over a little bit, uh, but, but I just wanted to go back real quick. Um, where were we here? Oh, Stone Circle Pictures. Uh, that's your production company. Was that established around 09, 10? And is that mostly for the documentaries? Yeah, it is. I needed a business entity and um, I had visited, uh, I, I have no relation to Stone Circles. I'm not uh, English, Scottish, or Irish. Uh, but I, <laughs> And, and I, I swear, I just thought I need a name. How about Stone Circle? And um, I, so that's been in business for a while as the entity that is the production company for my documentaries. Oh, wow. And okay. it shrinks and grows depending on if I'm working on a film or not. So um, uh, that's been a great, you know, just a great little uh, playhouse in the backyard uh, to be able to <laughs> make films that I'm interested in in an environment that I enjoy. Yeah. So uh, 2012, you worked with Tim Burton, your old buddy, uh, to oh, take buddy. his short film, uh, Frankenweenie, and become a, a major feature film. Uh, what can you tell us about that era? Uh, well, Joe, you were there too. It was, uh, again, the topic for cocktails. But um, <laughs> the, uh, Tim is such a unique human being. And he had done a short, a live action short with Shelley Duvall at Disney uh, called Frankenweenie. And um, so the pitch on that is I went to London, uh, Tim was in uh, Jim Henson's old studios. And I said, can I come over? I have an idea for kind of remaking Frank and Weenie basically. And I want to take him Frank and Weenie and Maleficent. I took him both movies at the same time. Oh. Um, and then uh, Dick Cook, who ran the studio at the time said, oh, you're going to see Tim. I love Tim. I want to come along. So then Tim, Dick came along and then Michael Eisner found that Dick was going and he said, oh, I love Tim. I want to go along. So um, Michael Eisner, Dick Cook and myself went to Tim's little office uh, and and visited. I said, you know, Frank and Weenie, I think it'd make a great feature. You've always wanted to flesh it out into a bigger story. And he he took to it immediately. And I, I one of his friends, uh, Mike Gabriel, again, brilliant artist, I brought on and we did a lot of visual development for it. Cool. Uh, Rick Heinrichs, another great animation CalArts alumni whose art directed a lot of Tim's movies, jumped on board uh, with John August, another great writer. <laughs> Uh, and part of Tim's cadre of people, and uh, we made it. Alison Abadi produced it in London. What a great process stop motion is. That's another topic. Yeah. Uh, it's another great guest for you someday. Yeah. Um, and then Maleficent, I, I brought a Mark Davis drawing of Maleficent. I had it in my briefcase. Uh, our meeting was done. I said, oh, one more thing. Um, I said, uh, Walt Disney's Maleficent, and I held it up, and he grabbed the drawing and pinned it to his wall, um, and said, great. That was the pitch. Um, <laughs> that was <laughs> and 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 he, so he was directing Maleficent for a year until he had, I think he was doing some Alice in Wonderland films and the schedule didn't work on out. Angelina Jolie was always involved. Yeah. And, and they you know got along terrific. It's just the schedules didn't quite work. But sometimes the pitch can be um wow. pretty simple. And Tim loving all things dark. Um, and all things Disney really understood what Maleficent could be. Wow, that's awesome. That would have been interesting if he had done yeah. it. Yeah, would have been, Yeah, it's it's a great movie and was really successful. But Tim would have uh, taken a different direction of his own. Yeah. So I just wanted to jump also to 2016. Uh, a person you and I both loved, Richard Sherman, who recently passed away, and I know you're working on a memorial show for him in November. Um, tell us about your relationship with Richard because he didn't score or do songs for any of your films, right? He did not. I mean, Richard uh, became a mentor to me and and I always admired his work but never worked with him. Yeah. I mean, just loved his work as as all of you did, I'm sure. And um, mm -hmm. I had seen him in concerts. I had seen him at D23. I had seen him on cruise ships doing his songbook right. and nobody yeah. was recording it and it was evaporating. I thought these yeah. performances are evaporating. Yeah. I, so I literally called him up. I said, uh, I went over to his house and I said, Richard, can I get you at a piano and just to do your songbook and do what you would do for D23 or, you know, just an hour of your music. And, and I went to PBS and I said, Richard Sherman, Songs of a Lifetime, would you air this if I did it? They said, yes. So I got 
everybody to a soundstage for a day, a single day. Wow. And I called in some singers and friends from the Broadway world of Disney and filmed, uh, it's been, you know, a few years ago, but filmed a day of Richard doing his songbook. And I'm so glad I did because it was never quite the same after that. And we have this amazing special of yeah, Richard right. Sherman doing his songbook. And it's, uh, I think it's still out there on PBS. You can, you can access it uh, in terms of a DVD of, those of you recall what a DVD is, um, and, and what a great experience. There is no more positive force in the world than Richard Sherman, no, no, and no. no more gifted. Like talk about Toonsmith. I mean, he, Alan Menken, yeah. those guys have something that uh, no one else has. Yeah, so uh, again, a, a mentor, and I just I had to do that movie out of just preserving it. I, I you should know this about me. I'm a hoarder. Uh, and and if my family were listening, it would they would agree. But I'm a neat hoarder. Uh, <laughs> but there's something about me that is afraid of losing things, and that goes towards making a movie about Howard Ashman. That goes towards making a movie about animation in the '90s or about Richard Sherman. I'm really a, I'm doing a book now about Disneyland, mm -hmm. uh, and and that the story of the origin story of Disneyland. I'm not an Imagineer. There are far better people like Tom Morris to tell those stories. But thanks to them and a bunch of people I'm working with, Chris Merritt, um, I'm able to to collaborate on that and help tell that story because I want to preserve things. And um, luckily, the studio occasionally allows me to do that. And that's yeah. exactly why we started the Zoomcast. Same thing. We yes. work with people. And I'd hear these stories. You know, uh, Gordon Hoops would tell me for years. I was there the day that the future world model was moved next to the world showcase model. Oh. And said, this is Epcot. And I'm like, nobody knows this, Gordon. Yeah. We need to record this. <laughs> so, totally so. I mean, I mean, I I preach that whenever I go. I'm, I'm going up to Vancouver to talk to the Disney Animation Studio there. Record your history, even if you yeah. put it on a shelf. Yeah. Just record it. And what yeah. you guys do is a huge service to all of us. Thank wow. you. Wow. Yeah, that's true. So, so um, let, 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 we're going to have to fast yeah. forward a bit. Just yeah. tell us about what's happening right now in, in Don's world. Yeah. We know you, you're always, it seems like you always got three or four balls in <laughs> well, the air juggling. <laughs> oh man, I, I'm, uh, I'm doing a, a biography on Ron Husband, the first African American animator at Disney uh, for PBS, um, American Masters kind of show. Um, finishing this book on Disneyland with a lot of help from Imagineers. Um, and uh, and contemplating the future in terms of uh, you know trying to paint when I can, and uh, trying to look at documentary stories and of interesting artists um, that are worth telling their stories and, um, and and that to me is heaven. If I can sit here once again in my pajamas um, and and edit or put together something that is about that. Um, I just love it. And it's, it's perfect. It, 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 my earlier career was uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and 600 people in four years and all that stuff. And I wouldn't trade a second of it. Now I can work with an editor and a, and a researcher and make films. And uh, that process to me is pretty heavenly at this point in my life. Yeah. That's great. Right. So at the end of uh, each journey, now that we're back in the present day, Joe yeah. and I ask all of our passengers the same question because we are on the eternal search, search for for what makes a guest experience be it a film a ride a show a broadway show a and a, a <laughs> timely timely yet, yet timeless. timeless wow um so many answers but i think the simplest one that comes to mind is is engagement it's that suspension of disbelief where you can go into an attraction um or sit in a concert hall or watch a movie and forget about the gas bills and the problems of life and be suspended and taken to another world for a while. And that's something that we long after as human beings and something that Disney does really well. The fact that you can go to a park um, and have that kind of experience. In fact, you could even go to a hotel room that's properly themed and have that experience um, or a vacation club or a cruise ship or watch an animated film from Pixar and just feel transported to another world. I think at, at its best, we're all world builders. Mm -hmm. We're all in the transportation business. Mm -hmm. And if we take you somewhere <laughs> for a time, take you out of your day, um, that's what the great authors of all time have done. And the great filmmakers, the great painters of all time. Oh. You know, if you go to see the Picasso Museum in Barcelona, 
It's yeah. full of amazing yeah. work. Mm -hmm. And you forget time and you forget you're there and you're just swept away to his mind. And I think that's what what we do at our best. Uh, I love that. I'm going to say I'm in the transportation business. Uh, that's great. You are. You, yeah. Wow. Thank uh, yeah, Don, God. thank you for the wow. wisdom. Wow. All your no, time. Back at you. You guys are great. <laughs> thank you. Some of my wow. movies but, time. <laughs> but it sounds like we, we need to uh, have a few cocktails because there are a number <laughs> of subjects here that need to be continued oh. <laughs> with cocktails and our pajamas on. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's so much to talk about. I, we could maybe do some themes, pajamas. I don't know. <laughs> all right all well right. don han thank you stick around yeah. we'll be right we're back, back. But, oh okay no, we, yeah yeah we're moving in we're, we're gonna, gonna go to the future we're gonna go to the future going to go? we're gonna go to next week next week okay shameless plug time i've got a new children's book yeah, out for yeah. Yeah. i'm an eight yellow bear and i'm doing a virtual book launch next week uh so check out my website lemonade the yellow bear let's and go. Let's go check it out and see how it's going to be. Yeah. All right, Don. All thank right. you again. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. A pleasure. Bye, everybody. Thank you. All right. Stay tuned, Don. Don't go anywhere because we are going to do the Q and A after. Hold tight. All right. So we hoped you guys enjoyed the ride. Thank you so much to our friend Don Hahn for time traveling with us today. If you have questions for Don, just stick around for our live Q&A in just 60 seconds. On behalf of Zeitgeist Design and Production, we thank you for spending an hour of your time with us on the Spirit of the Time Zoomcast. If you enjoyed the journey, please check out all 38 of our time travel adventures on our YouTube channel or under the Zoomcast section at zeitgeist-usa.com. They're also available as podcasts wherever you listen, and please tell your friends. Set your pocket watch now to join us again on Friday, October 18th, when our time machine passenger will be the man who oversaw the production and construction of nearly every Disney theme park since Tokyo Disneyland in 1983, Craig Russell. So until then, we'll see you soon. Get it.